Okay, Psalm 51. Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. That you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And uphold me by your generous spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners shall be converted to you. Deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed, O God. The God of my salvation. And my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, Open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. For you do not desire sacrifice, or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Do good in your good pleasure to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then ye shall be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then they shall offer bulls on your altar. The great psalm of repentance. And uh, again, the title gives us the circumstances. Uh, this is a song that was to be written. It's addressed to the chief musician. It's a psalm written by David, and it's specific to an event. And that is David being busted, as it were, by Nathan the prophet for his sin in committing adultery with Bathsheba and then the contract murder of her husband Uriah. And as we had noted last week, there's a variety of different, uh, I guess what I would call really theological fundamentals that we get from this psalm. Things that are very critical for us to know. And, and the first point, which is as far as we got last week, was the appeal, the confession, and the acknowledgement. The appeal to God on the basis of who God is. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. That's the basis of the appeal. Not on anything that David had a credit to his account because he didn't have anything. He'd committed adultery and he'd had a man murdered. So what could he say? Lord, uh, do something nice for me because I'm a good guy. Well, no, you're not. And, and so his appeal was on that basis. And then the confession of his sin, that's really coming into agreement with God to see how God sees what I've done. And what I've done is, is bad. And it's a sin and it's a violation of what God commands me to do and what God created me to be. And, and not only that, but there's the acknowledgement too of the nature that we're born with, this sin nature, and that when we're born again by the Spirit of God, our, our sin nature, the old man, the old nature, there's all these things are synonymous with that old nature, it, it comes in conflict with this new nature that we've been born again with. When we're born again, God gives us a new nature. And now those two are in conflict with one another. And so there's that, that acknowledgement that that's how we're born. We're, we just we come wired from the factory with that software. Uh, we don't have a choice about that. Uh, and that's the result of the fall. Now, uh, there's a variety of things that we learned in there, and I don't want to uh, re go back and, and rehash all of them because you could, the video's up on the webpage as is the audio, or you can get a CD of it. But there are a couple of things that I wanted to remind us of because they're worth reminding us of. And that is that when we repent before God, that acknowledgement, seeing our sin the way that God sees it, and when we acknowledge that to him, and when we truly desire to repent of it, 
to turn from it and go the other way. That not only does God forgive, but God also forgets. And that's critical to us. Uh, David has it right when he says, against you and you only have I sinned, because all sin, any sin, is always first and foremost against God. Now there are all the other people that get affected by your sin and by my sin, but all sin first and foremost is, is against God. But God intentionally forgets us, and the, the thing that I wrote in my notes and I brought it up last week is that even when God says, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more, and as comforting as that is, I remember my sin. <laughs> You know, I, I remember, I know all the things that I've done, and those things, they haunt me. The things that I've done haunt me. And sometimes I even worry about them somehow coming back up again in my life, you know, like a bad meal. It's sooner or later, you know, it's, it's coming up. And uh, it was just that reminder that what, what haunts me is what God forgets. And so when it does come up, in my mind or in my heart. It's not God that's bringing it up. It's either me that's dredging up old memories uh, or it's Satan bringing them up for me. And it's one of the great things that he loves to do because he can't, he can't do anything about my future. Uh, but he can certainly remind me of my past. I think Dan and I were just talking about this the other day when Satan reminds you of your past, remind him of his future. You know, I, I mean... That's the reality of it. He can, he can torment us. He can remind us of things. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. But that's all he can do. He can't make us do anything. And uh, so what, what, what I remember, God intentionally forgets. What haunts me is what God has put away from his mind. And so as we are born again by the Spirit of God, God gives us this great gift. This great gift. And that is the gift of repentance. The opportunity to start fresh again. It's like a never-ending stream of do-overs. And as the Apostle Paul addressed this uh, at length in places like Romans 6, 7, and 8, we know that if we have the mindset that, well, you know, God will forgive me, so I'll just go ahead and do it, and then I'll just ask God for forgiveness. Well, that misses the whole point of what repentance is. Repentance is turn and go a whole other direction. Agree with God that this is a sin. It's a sin against him, and I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to go the other way. I want to walk in the paths of righteousness, in that path of humble obedience to God every single day. Uh, that's where I want to go. But you know, I know, when we sin, when we stumble and when we fall, it feels to us as if it's a process to get back on track again does it does it feel that way to you like you, you can say okay well uh, Lord forgive me you know I don't ever want to do that again and God says okay I do forgive you but then it seems to take us a few steps to get back up and running again as it as it were and and that's what where we come to tonight in in uh, uh, point number two uh, so this is Psalm 51. Point two. Point one was last week. Point two is tonight. And that is uh, what we call the cleansing and the restoration. The cleansing and the restoration. And, and that really comes in verses 6 to 12. And I know point number one was uh, verses 1 to 7. But I want to back up just a little bit to include verses 6 and 7. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. And in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Okay, now our cleansing from our sin, when we stumble and fall, it begins with recognition. You have to know, you have to realize that I, I have failed. I have sinned. I have violated uh, something that God told me not to do or I have not done something that God told me to do or something that he addresses in his word. He tells me to do this or do that. And if I don't do what he tells me, well, that's a sin. And, and when I come to the realization of it, and you guys know, sometimes we come to the realization of it after the fact, right? We go, oh, oh, darn. I, oh, I should have done that and I missed it. Oh, Lord, forgive me. Uh, and a lot of times in our, 
is this what we call the sin of commission the sin of commission and the sin of commission is willfully doing something that God tells us not to do so when God tells us don't do this or don't do that and we do it that is a sin of commission a sin of omission is to not do what God tells us to do so if we know the right thing to do as James says if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it that's sin but with that recognition comes the realization that I need to be cleansed. And I like the use of that word, cleanse. And that's what, uh, when you look at verse 7 especially, uses words like purge and wash. Those are the words that I like, purge or wash. Now, when he says, uh, you know, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean, it's probably a reference uh, in all likelihood to Leviticus chapter 14, verses 1 to 7. And this was the, the prescribed um, spiritual slash medicinal approach to healing from leprosy. Now, in the Old Testament, under the law, there really weren't any doctors. When you get sick, go see the doctor. When you got sick, you always went to see the priest. Instead, when we study the book of Leviticus, we'll talk about that because it's fascinating. But you go to the priest, and part of the cleansing for, uh, uh, for um, leprosy was to go to the priest, and he would mix up this water, and then he'd use this hiss, or, yeah, he'd use this hyssop, he'd dip it in the one, and then splash it on the one who had leprosy. And in a lot of ways, really in just about every way, leprosy is, is a picture or a type of sin. And if you've never had that study before, we'll do it sometime. I don't want to get into it right now, but we'll, we'll do that because uh, leprosy is an opportunistic disease. Uh, once it takes root, uh, if you don't do anything about it, it will gradually spread and take over everything. And sin is the same way. If you leave sin unchecked in your life, sooner or later, it's going to overrun everything. And, and, and ultimately, it'll kill you. But Notice something here too, specifically in verse 7. We like this, purge me with hyssop. We like that, wash me. We like that. But notice something, purge me and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Now you notice something that David states here clearly. These are the results, the I shall be clean, I shall be whiter than snow. Those are results of something that only God can do. Only he can do this. No, you can't make yourself clean. You can't make your spirit or your soul or your heart or your mind whiter than snow. In other words, listen to this. What God does, he does thoroughly. Right? He does it thoroughly thoroughly. He doesn't partially cleanse you. He doesn't partially wash you. He doesn't say, oh, okay, well, I'm, you know, I'm just going to kind of take the edge off of that. It's gone. Clean. Purged. I like that word. Purged. It no longer exists between as far as God is looking at you. Now, you still see it. I see it. The people around us still see it. But between you and God, you've been justified just as if I'd never sinned. So in God's eyes, when he purges your sin, when he, when he washes you of your sin, he makes you to appear to him as if you had never sinned. Now obviously that's something that only God can do. I can't do that for myself. No one can do that for you. Only God can do that. But when he does it, he does it Thoroughly, You don't have to worry about is there something still in there that I need to be cleansed of because when we recognize what we've done, when we repent of it before him to turn and go a new direction, I don't want to do that again. I realize that that's the wrong thing to do. Not only does it displease God, but it certainly doesn't do me any spiritual good at all. God says, okay, I'll, I will cleanse you. I'll purge that from you. So that when you stand before me, it is as if you had never sinned before. Now, you, know, you might note also here too, uh, specifically down in verse 8, Make me hear joy and gladness, that the bones you have broken may rejoice. When, 
when you were in a state of, I, I guess we would call here uncleanness, when you have sinned and you have not yet repented, there's no happiness. <laughs> it's, a, it's kind of a miserable state to be in because you have the indwelling spirit who is convicting you, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. We have the indwelling spirit who is convicting us, but we have not yet responded with repentance. And in that meantime, between the recognition of what I've done and, and repenting, boy, that can be a miserable stretch right there. And, and sometimes, I gotta, I gotta tell you too, that's, that's one of Satan's greatest little time frames right there. Because on the one hand, he'll be the one to tell you that you cannot go to God. I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute too. So we have to watch that little span of time, which is one of the reasons why Jesus tells us in places like Hebrews chapter 10, 19 to 22, or Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, is to get straight to the throne. As soon as you realize that you have sinned, come straight to the throne, even boldly before the throne, and seek forgiveness from God in this purging and this washing, because he will. Don't waste your time. Don't waste time between your failure and coming to the Lord in repentance. Because that's what that is, that little gap in there. That's wasted time. Don't go there. Now, there's no joy in gladness because the weight of conviction is like, David says here, it's like, uh, like bones being broken. It's the weight of conviction. Have you ever been convicted in your heart of doing something wrong? Now, uh, I'll say this. This is what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will convict us of our sin. Now, this is an important distinction here. Conviction is not guilt or shaming. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit will alert you to the fact that you've sinned. You go, uh, shouldn't have done that. And you'll, you'll know that before you do it, too. I shouldn't do this. But, you know, you go ahead and you do it anyways because you're, you will yourself to do it. You know, Satan can't make you do anything. But you can certainly will yourself to do it. And, and you do, in spite of what the Holy Spirit is telling you. And, and, you know, God doesn't make you feel guilt and he doesn't shame you. You may feel ashamed for what you've done. That's okay. But he doesn't shame you. God's not the one standing on your shoulder saying, you miserable sinner. I knew you would fail me. I knew it, you sinner. You sin, 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 sin. That, you know, that's, that's not God that's doing that. And maybe you... And it may be the devil, but it certainly is not God. But he will convict you, and that is compelling. Conviction is compelling. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 12, verse 20, it's described as burning coals on the head. Man, you just, you can't escape it. Now, when we know it's conviction, I'll tell you how you know it's the difference between conviction and guilt, is conviction drives us to Jesus for forgiveness. That's what conviction does. Guilt doesn't. Guilt will pound you down. Guilt will back you into a corner and rain body blows down on you for, for what a miserable, stinking failure you are. That's what guilt will do. Conviction doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit says, you sinned. Now let's get to Jesus. Quick, look, quick, come on. Let's, quick, come on, come on, let's go. We're going to Jesus. We're going to get that forgiveness. That's what we need to do. Now, let me say this. Of course, you need to get to Jesus because he's the only one that can cleanse or purge us of that sin. But when we sin, if there is little or no conviction for what we've done or the realization that we've done anything wrong, then perhaps what's going on is that we've given our sin nature so much control over our life that we really have little or no sensation of that guilt or conviction for what we've done. You know, it's okay to feel guilty if it drives you to Jesus for forgiveness. That's conviction. But if it's not conviction, if it's guilt, if it's yourself making yourself feel guilty or Satan making you feel good, it's going to be isolating. He's going to push you back into a corner. And if you can sin, 
do something that you know is wrong and you feel no conviction at all? I wonder if you've been born again at all. I wonder if you're even a Christian. Because if the Holy Spirit indwells you, he will convict you when you sin. He'll convict you before you sin because you know that what you're about to do is wrong. You know that you have not done what he has asked you to do. So if there's no conviction of wrongdoing at all in your heart, then I gotta wonder. Now, David's plea here in Psalm 51 comes from a heart that is broken. Why is his heart broken? His heart isn't broken because he was caught, even though he worked very hard to cover up his sin, right? And we do the same thing. We're, we're, just, we're just like David in that, yes, we've sinned and we, we work really hard to cover it up so that no one will ever find out. And as we had mentioned last week from... Where was it? Numbers chapter 32, verse 23. You may be sure that your sin will find you out. Because you can hide it from everybody. But you can't hide it from God. God knows what you do. God knows what you've done. And so you can't hide it from him. But David here, something that you see when you read Psalm 51, he's not sorry that he got caught. He's sorry that he did it to begin with. And that's a big difference. I think you can go to jail, you can go to prison, and everybody in there is sorry they got caught. Everybody. But how many of them are really genuinely sorry that they ever committed the crime to begin with? You know, next time I go, I, I can do the same thing again, but I know how to do it now so I won't get caught. Learned, learned a lesson there, right? Now, it's interesting here because David had failed God. That's what he feels here. That's why he's saying this. You, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. His heart is broken because he's failed the Lord. But you'll notice, too, in Psalm 51... David never mentions a fear of judgment. He never mentions, oh, oh, you know, Lord, you know, I'm, now I'm, I'm going to hell now. You know, I'm, I'm certain of it. Lord, don't, don't send me to hell. He never talks about that. But he does talk about the uncleanness of his sin and the results of that uncleanness. Yes, he says, you know, don't cast me away from your presence. Take not your Holy Spirit from me, which is interesting uh, because uh, I believe he knows that God will not. Uh, we'll talk about that too. But David never mentions that fear of judgment. And I've talked with 10,000 Christians who've thought when they sin and when they fall, God's going to crush them like a bug. God's just going to hammer me. He's going to take me out to the woodshed. He's going to beat me senseless for doing this over and over again. No, that is not what God does. And that's where we sometimes get the confusion between conviction and guilt. Now, I think the Apostle Paul touches on this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 56, where he observes, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, apart from Christ, if you're not a Christian and you do what is wrong, your conscience will still tell you that you've done something wrong. And so you work your whole non-Christian life trying to cement over that, that conscience so that you can do what you want to do freely and not feel the guilt about it. Now, if you're a non-Christian, if you've not been born again by the Spirit of God and you feel guilt, why? Why do you feel guilt? Because you just violated a law and you know that there's a penalty for violating the law. Everybody knows that. It's intuitive. It's built right into us, just like the sin nature that we're born with. God puts in every human being a conscience. For the Christian, it's heightened. It's, it's tender. It's sensitive. For the non-Christian, the Apostle Paul even describes the conscience of the unchristian being cauterized or being seared with a hot iron. That's cauterization. If you know what it means to cauterize. It cements over it so that the, so that the conscience becomes calloused or thick with hard skin. That's kind of fascinating. Why? 
because the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. When you sin as a non-Christian, you know that you violated a law and you know there's a penalty for it. Oh, you can say, well, I don't believe in all of that. And to me, some of the people are the most vocal opponents of God and of Christ and of the Bible are the people that are the most guilty. They feel it. They feel that sense of guilt and so they lash out against what they intuitively know to be true. See, God's word also tells us that he has set eternity in the hearts of man. Every human being intuitively knows that there's something beyond this life. Everyone does. And God's it. God even says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, that he's made himself apparent to everyone through what he has created. And then he went to the length of revealing himself through his word and through his son. So no one has an excuse. So even those that are the most uh, vociferous rejectors of these things, I think are the ones that sense that guilt the greatest. And I don't know what the atheist thinks about at night when his head is on his pillow. And, and probably a lot of them don't think about this at all. They just don't believe it at all. But I, I think that some of them are thinking, you know, there is this, there is this sense that there is a certain judgment and, and a final judgment for the things that I've done. And people try to placate their own sense of guilt by embracing things like Hinduism. You know, that I can do enough good things to outweigh the bad things. That's Hinduism 101. I can do enough good things to outweigh the bad things. So when I stand before God, you know, he's got the list. And I, my good list is longer than my bad list. And then I get in. Doesn't work that way. Otherwise, Jesus never would have had to come and die for us. So there's that certainty, that knowledge that there's something there. Now, for David, the sacrificial system, being able to go to the tabernacle later after Solomon built it, the temple, to be able to go there and to offer up a sacrifice, the sacrificial system, which foreshadows Christ, right, that that transferring of the guilt onto an innocent animal and then taking its life. The sacrificial system, foreshadowing Christ. The purpose of that is to provide the believer with a covering or a payment for the sin that I have committed. So, while I have sinned, the conviction of the Holy Spirit compels me towards Christ and His sacrifice, not away from Him. So, check your heart. When you stumble, when you fall, when you sin, what are you, what are you being compelled to do? What's the compulsion? Well, for a lot of us, honestly, the compulsion is to slink away from God because we're, we feel unclean. Because we have that sense, that feeling that I am unclean and that I cannot go to God now, not like this. And in fact, the Holy Spirit says, no, don't wait. Hightail it to the throne that's the purpose of the sacrifice. That's what Jesus died for. So that you could make a direct beeline to the throne of God and find that forgiveness that we need in that moment. Now, where is Satan in all of this? He can't, he can't make you sin. He can tempt you to sin. And I was having this conversation with Steve here, I think earlier in the week or something. You know, we, I, I think sometimes we give Satan too much credit. You know, I, I don't think he's as busy as we think that he is because we get into enough trouble without him. You know, we, we don't need a lot of help from Satan to get into trouble. And we're perfectly capable of stumbling and falling and sinning. Now, now he'll dangle the carrot before us, but he can't make us sin. God doesn't tempt us to sin, but Satan, Satan will. And... Uh, I would contend that it's at this point when Satan does his best work because he's the one to tell you not to go to God for forgiveness. He's the one that will tell you, oh, oh no, not this time. No, you this is the le you you got on God's last nerve. You that you you are the straw that broke God's back. You you cannot go to him now. That that will be what he'll tell you. God's love is for everyone, but not you. God's forgiveness is for everyone, but not you. 
Uh, that, oh, that's his specialty. And with every one of those things that he says that we believe, he isolates us. He isolates us. He isolates us. You ever watched a boxing match? You ever seen one fighter get another fighter into a corner? And once they back him into a corner, what do they do? Just rain down the blows on him. Just as many and as fast as they can. That's what Satan does. Once he gets you into a corner, he can just rain down the blows on top of you. Now, he can't kill you. And he can't rob you of your salvation. He can, like scripture says, be a roaring lion prowling about seeking whom he may devour. But I like what Pastor Greg said about this years ago. He's a roaring lion, but Jesus pulled his teeth on the cross. So all he can do is just gum you. That's all he can do. Now, you know, I got to tell you, if, if, if there was a lion, a full-size lion, and if you've ever been close to one of them, they're big critters. If he was standing on my chest roaring at me, I would be petrified even if he doesn't have teeth. But the fact is he could scare the daylights out of you. But he can't kill you. He could just gum you. That's all he can do. But some of his most persuasive work is done with that whisper in the ear, isn't it? It's, it's you know, you guys know, and I've said this before, you know, I, Satan can approach you first thing in the morning, any one of you in this room, and say, would you like to be a heroin addict today? And you're going you're gonna to go, get out of here. You know, Lord Jesus, take care of this bum. But he can whisper in your ear, God loves everyone except you. God's forgiveness is for everyone, but not you. That's his best work. It's those little things, that quiet stuff, the stuff that you can hardly hear, but man, it goes straight into your brain and straight into your heart. Equally, he will try to convince you that you didn't really sin. Oh, come on. That was not that big of a deal. Seriously. There's serious sinners out there. You know, doing serious, what you did, that ain't nothing. God will forgive you, don't worry about it. He'll, he'll get you either coming or going. He'll whisper the same thing into your ear, whatever direction you're headed. Come on, it was just a little white lie. <laughs> As if there's any other, kind of, it's still a lie, right? We didn't, white, blue, green, plaid, it doesn't matter. It's, it's still a lie. But he'll try to convince you that your sin wasn't as bad as his sin. You know, yeah, yeah, okay, well, yeah, yeah, but, you know, you're still, you still didn't sin like she did. I mean, she's, like, you know her, and she's a sinner. So you, you didn't do so, you know, he'll try to compare you with other people or, or try to somehow convince you to, to uh, rationalize in your own mind that what you did is not that big of a deal. You know, it's my buddy, Dane Wadley, a pastor down in Southern California. He said, you know what rationalize means? It means to ration out lies. You know, I didn't, really, it wasn't that bad. <laughs> yeah, it was. <laughs> we, we try to rationalize our, our own sin, right? Now, we need to be aware of these things because 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11 says, we are not unaware of his schemes. We know that he does this. So when you hear that voice getting you, coming or going, you know that the only voice that you need to listen to is the one that compels you to go straight to Jesus. Straight to Jesus. Do not pass, go, do not collect 100. Just go straight to Jesus. Don't you... I, I don't know how many times I can say it because I, I think I need to keep hearing it. The time between the time that I sin and the time that I go straight back to Jesus in repentance, that is critical mass, that time right there. Because that's where Satan's going to try to get you coming or going. That's where I'm going to try to rationalize things. That's where I'm going to allow my own self to condemn myself because we're good at that. Again, we don't need a whole lot of help from Satan to condemn ourselves. We can do that all on our own. Boy, that time right in there. That's critical. 
And it's always going to be the Holy Spirit of God that drives you, compels you to go to Jesus. So any other voice, any other compulsion, any other sense to do anything else is not the Lord. I don't know what voice to listen to. <laughs> and some of us hear a lot of voices, you know. <laughs> I don't know what voice to listen to. Listen to the one that compels you to go straight to Jesus without any delay, without any turns left or right. Remember, Satan does his best work when we're isolated, not just isolated from the fellowship, but when he can isolate us from God. Now, we know that the Lord never leaves us. He never departs from us. But what we depart from is our attention on him. It's like we do in prayer. You know, when we pray, we oftentimes say, Lord, you know, I just come before you right now. And God's saying, you know, you've been before me you know, your, your whole life. You know, what we do is we turn our attention to him. We, we take our eyes off of him, then we put our eyes back on him. And, and it's an important a distinctive, it's it kind of a you know quantum mechanics for, for us sinners, is in order to fix your eyes on Jesus, you have to not look at other things. <laughs> you know, to get your eyes off of other things in order to look at him. Disengage here, re-engage here. And we're going to come to this in a minute here. Because what David wants from God in all of this is David wants restoration. That's what he wants. I was someplace with you, Lord. I got off track, and now I need to get back on track. David is looking for restoration. We want and we need to be clean from our sin, and he will cleanse us. Remember what God does, he does thoroughly, but we need to move forward. You've heard me say this too. I quote myself often here. I don't know enough to quote anybody else, so I'll just keep quoting myself. Is if if you're in a if you're on the battlefield in the middle of a firefight, you don't just stop and stand there in the middle of the battlefield. You run, you run, and you jump behind things, and you get out of the way, and you if the bullets are flying past, you get out of the way where the bullets are flying past. Don't just stand there, and that's what we need to do as believers. We need to keep moving forward. Okay, so. David asked God not to do something. That's down in verse 11. Don't cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And the funny thing about that is, is God says that he won't. He's promised that he won't. But when we sin, it feels like that. Doesn't it? It feels that way. Now that's an important word, feel. Because just because you feel it doesn't mean that it's real right? You may feel it. You may feel a million miles from God, but when God says, I will never, ever leave you or forsake you, and if you feel like you're a million miles away, what's happened? He's still there. My attention has gone elsewhere, though, right? That's what's happened. I'm looking somewhere other than where God is, because he's right here. I love that. I is one of the last pieces I wrote for my blog. It's this whole idea about people saying, "Well, you know, I don't know where God is." You know, Christians, Christians saying, "Well, you know, I don't know where God is in in the storm. I don't, I don't know where He is in the tragedy." You know, but but that's okay. You know, we don't have to know where. He, and I'm like, wait a second, I know where He is. He's right here, right where He's always been. Right here, if you're a believer, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, He's right here. He hasn't gone anywhere. I'm the one that's disengaged my attention from him and looking elsewhere. I'm the one that's become overwhelmed by my circumstance when I've taken my eyes off the Lord. Boy, and i got to tell you, that's easy to do. It's easy to do. Yeah, you ask people how they're doing, you say, well, you know, under the circumstances. It's easy to get underneath the circumstance. Very easy. Because it's emotional. It's emotional. And I feel the weight of the circumstance. And I feel the depressing nature of my situation. And it feels bad. But just because I feel it doesn't necessarily make it so. So, what does David ask for here? Three things. Point number two, letter A, would be he's asking God to create in me a clean heart. 
Now, David knew that the heart of the problem was a problem in the heart. Okay, that's where the problem was. Now, his sin came from within, just like your sin and mine. So something within has to change. Right? Something within has to That's where the sin comes from. So something within has to change. Now the heart in Scripture is not merely a blood-pumping organ, but rather defined from Hebrew the source of life of the inner person in its various aspects with a focus on feelings, thoughts, and volition. That's the will. Now, it's interesting, too, that the word clean, created in me a clean heart, means pure, and I like this, genuine. Genuine. Now, that's interesting. Not just clean, not just washed, not just pure, but genuine. Now, something else that becomes immediately clear when we talk about having a clean heart, a genuine heart, our inner self, our, our inner person, our, our feelings, our thoughts, our will, our will, how does that get clean? How does that get created anew? Something that only God can do. Only God can do that. You can't do that. You cannot pay the price. You cannot do penance. You cannot say, say hail Marys or hail anything for that matter. There's nothing that you can do to cleanse that part of yourself. There's no drug that can reach that. There's no psychotherapy that can get there. Only God can touch that. It's a place that only God can go. Great passage in Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26. I'm quoting the NIV where God says listen to this I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will, I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Now I believe God does that when we're born again. When we're born again, that's what he does. And then for the rest of our natural life, he keeps chiseling away at that heart and making it more and more fleshly. Yeah, even as it's described to us in Romans chapter 2, circumcision of the heart. He cuts away the excess flesh from the heart and gets down to the heart that he created, the heart that he put in you and that he put in me. That's what he's getting down to. And only he can do that. Create in me a clean heart, a pure heart, an undivided heart. Get, Lord, get me down to the heart that you put in me. Not the heart that I've created for myself. So create in me a clean heart. Then he says, this would be letter B for you note takers. He wants renewal. Renewal. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Now the word renew that is used here means this is great. Dictionary can be your best friend, you know. This word means to place in a state or condition identical or nearly the same as the prior state. Now, I like that. Because what's, what's David's predicament here? David needed to get back to where he was when he was walking right with Christ. Yeah. Walking right with God. When we're walking right with Christ. We need to get back to something because we got off track. That's why we sinned. Oh, we got off track. We listened to my flesh, listen to the voices in my head, listen to Satan's temptations, whatever. I'm, I'm off course, even if it's only one degree. I'm off course, and I need to get back on course now. I, I need to get renewed. Now, God gives us, when we're born again, God gives us a new start. 2 Corinthians 5.17. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things become new. Yeah, I still got the, the hard drive in my head that still remembers all the stupid stuff that I've done. But when it comes to my relationship to God, he sees me as being brand new. Hallelujah. <laughs> Nobody else does. And hopefully over the course of our life, people are going to look at us and say, you know what? You're different. <laughs> you know, I knew you before, I know you now, and I don't know what happened, but you're different. I like that. That's what I want. When we sin, listen to this. Think about this. When we sin, we intentionally stray from the new nature that God has given us. 
We acknowledge that God's given us a new nature, a fresh start, 2 Corinthians 5.17. We acknowledge that. We believe that he's given us a new nature when we're born again by his spirit. And what I need to do is I need to get back onto that because what I just did, I strayed from it. Remember, I've got two natures. I got the old nature, and I got the new nature that God gives me. And I can follow either one. And if I feed the old nature, boy, it gets strong. And if I feed the new nature, oh, that gets strong too. Every step of obedience, you heard me say this, every step of obedience is like pounding a nail into the coffin of the old nature. And then every time I sin, it's like prying those nails back out of the coffin and letting the old nature back out again to run wild. When we sin, we are intentionally straying away from the new nature that God gave us. So we need to get back on track. We don't need to be born again again. The new nature is still there. He doesn't take your new nature away from you. It's still there. I've met lots of people over the years that, you know, it's like every Sunday they raise their hand to receive Christ. Just like, you know, you, just, <laughs> you, you, know, you only need to be born again once. You don't need to be born again, 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 again. But we do need to repent frequently. Really, every day. And sometimes multiple times every single day, right? That's the gift. God says, you don't need to be born again. You've already been born again. But what I'm giving you now is repentance as a gift. You can come back to me any time you stumble and fall. And I will make you clean again. And we'll get back up and we'll do it better the next time. That's what God does. It's like, you know, we've got this do-over again. So we get to keep doing over, doing over, doing it. Not being born again. Just do-over. We need to be renewed in that original new nature that God has given us. It's, now look at that. He says, um, renew a steadfast spirit within me. What is a steadfast spirit? Well, steadfast spirit is what stays on track. And you know, sometimes we're walking right with Jesus. And it feels good, doesn't it? To walk right with Jesus. Things are on track. Things are lined up. And man, when we step off, man, all of a sudden, you know, well, you know what a train is when it goes off the track? It's a wreck. You know? <laughs> That's what happens to us when we get off track. We turn into a wreck. David says, renew me. I need to be clean. So create in me, create in me this clean heart, this heart of flesh, the heart that you gave me, that you created for me. Renew me, get me back on track. And then thirdly, or letter C, this is in verse 12 down here, is to restore. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. This word restore is very similar to the word renew. And it means renovating or reconstructing. Renovating or reconstructing. And if you're in construction, you know that sometimes in order to renovate something, you got to tear it all the way down to the foundation. That's where you got to go. Did anybody ever see Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House? Cary Grant. Oh, come on, people. That is a classic film. Mr. Blanding's Builds His Dream House? Oh, Oh, it's a yeah, it's a old, but it's good. <laughs> Cary Grant, Myrna Loy, oh man, it's a classic. It's he's a city dweller and he buys a house out in the country, and ultimately he ends up spending infinitely more money than what he ever thought possible. Which the the movie The Money Pit is based on it with Tom. Oh, everybody knows that. Yeah, Money Pit. Yeah, so that's it was based on Mr. Blaney's Bill's his dream house, but. It, it, there's a significant point at the end of the movie where Cary Grant, is just, he's done. He's finished. He's so wiped out because he spent so much more on this house than what he ever thought. But one of the construction guys came to him and says, you know, the foundation was good. And you know, that's, that's Jesus for you and for me. When we've been born again by his spirit, it, that's our foundation. And sometimes what God does in our life is he tears us all, the down, all down to the foundation. He takes us apart, room by room, board by board, all the way down so that there's nothing left but him, and then he starts building. So sometimes, you've heard me say this, we, we talk about, you know, well, you know, what's God doing in your life? <laughs> in my life, he's undoing. <laughs> That's what he's doing. 
I, I feel like sometimes I'm more in the demolition than the construction phase. And that's what he does. He puts us through circumstances to take us apart. When we sin, listen carefully and think about this. When we sin, it is because there is damage. There is immaturity. There is ignorance. There is self-will. There is pride. There is a whole host of things that led us astray that knocked us off course, the voices that we followed rather than the leading of the Spirit. And the bottom line is, something needs repair. Something needs repair. Now ask Deb, she'll tell you. I am all about getting down to the heart, right down to the cause. I don't want to just treat the symptom. I want to get down, don't give me a Band-Aid, don't give me a pill. Let's figure out what created this situation in the beginning, and let's deal with that. That's what I want to get down to, right, hon? Let's get down to the root. That's what God wants to do. That's what God wants to do. And that's what David wants to do. Get all the way down to what it is that caused me to do that. Are you listening to me? That caused me to even want to do that. Think about this. <laughs> Think about this, friends. You... Well, maybe not you, but me. I've got a sin or sins that you keep stumbling to. Same thing. And it keeps coming up over and over and over again. And you keep asking for forgiveness and you keep repenting. At least you think you are. You're doing your best to repent. And it's the same thing that keeps coming up over and over and over again. Why? Why? Because you haven't gotten down to the cause of it. You haven't gotten down to the damaged part that keeps making you want to do that. And that's where God goes. And he'll go there if you want to. So maybe next time you stumble and fall in that same old sin over and over again, say, Lord, don't just forgive me. Yes, forgive me. But show me why I keep doing this. Help me to understand why I keep doing the things that I don't want to do. And you may even need to talk with somebody else about that. You may need to talk with, um, with your pastor or with you know, somebody that you saw, a professional. You may need to talk with somebody about that that can help you walk through that. Because sometimes it's, it's tough stuff. Sometimes it's really hard. And there's things that need to get uprooted. Things that need to get pulled out by the roots. The bottom line is something needs repair. There is a, there's, there's a breach. There's an unprotected spot. You, we used to say there's a chink in your armor. There's a spot in the armor. You know, even when you put on armor, you know, as a soldier, there were still spots that they could get into, like underneath the arm or in the joints. Or, or if you had a, a split in your armor, there's a chink in the armor. That's where an arrow can get in, a dart, a knife. Something can get in right there. There's a division. There's a, a, a pleat. There's a pleat. There's a fold right there where something can get in. Something can hide in there when something's pleated. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19, again quoting the NIV. God says, I will give them an undivided heart. Why do I keep sinning? Why do I keep doing the very thing that I don't want to do? I've got a divided heart. I've got a divided heart. There's a part of me that wants to keep doing it. That's why I keep doing it. I want to keep doing it. And as long as I want to keep doing it, I'll keep doing it. As long as I see that the value of satisfying that, that thing is greater than the value of obedience, I'll keep doing it. But sooner or later, there's a time when you say, you know what, I am sick of this thing. Lord, take me down to the root. Take me down to where this started. Help me to know. I'm not talking about, you know, past life regression or hypnosis, reliving your past, but sometimes, you know, you just got to look back and say, oh, this is it. 
this is what happened to me that caused me to have this area of damage in my life that now continues to produce the same sin and, and disobedience. I don't want to go too far with that, but there's truth there. It's like coming back to home base. You know, first of all, uh, like I said, it's our salvation. We're born again by the Spirit of God. He lays the foundation of Christ in our life. Sometimes he tears things down, but he's going to rebuild again too. And there is nothing like the remembrance of the fact that you've been born again by the Spirit of God. There's nothing like remembering that. That he saved me. That he saved me. He delivered me. He did it, not me. I didn't do it. You know, long ago I stopped saying, you know, I chose Jesus. You know, I accepted Jesus. I stopped saying that a long time ago. He grabbed me like a, like a, a coal out of the fire. He's the one that saved me, restoring to me the joy of thy salvation. Not my salvation, thy salvation. We should never tire, ever tire of remembering what Jesus did for us. That he saved us. That he went to the cross to die, to pay the price for your sin and mine. And there's nothing like remembering that first realization when it really hit us really hit us. Maybe it wasn't the, the moment that you were born again. Maybe it was later when you thought, oh, now I get it. Now I get it. And I understand it. And he says, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Joy is something that's only for born again Christians. There's happiness for other people, but not joy. Because joy is that ability to rise above our circumstance and see things the way that God sees them. And then we can look at things and say, okay, I know what this is. I know what this is for. I know the role that this plays. We were just talking about that Tuesday night. God saved me by his grace. So restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Lord, take me back to square one. Get me back on the right track. Get me back to my foundation. Repair what is damaged. Fix what is broken. Show me what is the root cause, Lord, because I don't want to come back this way again. One last thing here. In verse 12, the NIV reads, it says, uh, you know, restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me by your generous spirit. We certainly need God to uphold us. The New International Version reads, grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. The New Living Translation reads, make me willing to obey. Ah, I think that's interesting and I think that's significant because what we need is a transformation of the will because when I sin it's because I will to sin that's why so we need to get down to the will I need to have a will that desires obedience is greater than anything else what I'm saying and I think what David is saying here too is we have to want this we really have to want this it's not enough to just to intellectually agree with the pastor while he's teaching. It's not enough to look at it on the page and say, oh, that's, that's beautiful. It's not enough. You have to want this from the heart. So, how badly do you want this? How badly do you want to walk in humble obedience to Christ? Now, for us as followers of Jesus who have been transformed by his spirit and we're trying and, and we're desiring and we're especially, we're willing to walk in humble obedience to him, we possess something that David did not possess. David didn't have Jesus inside. He had God on the outside. But he didn't have Jesus on the inside. And we do. If we've been born again by the Spirit of God, we have the crucified and resurrected Savior dwelling in our hearts by faith. And now we're not asking him to come and do this for me. We're saying, Lord, you're already here. You're already doing these things. You're already granting these. This is already the construction process that you're doing in my heart right now. And Lord, and even if I'm not paying attention, even if I'm not cooperating, Lord, you're still doing this stuff in me. Is that awesome? He's doing this stuff in me even when I'm not asking him to. Why? Because he bought me and he paid for me and he owns me. And he loves me. 
He loves me so much, he's not going to leave me this way. Do I want to cooperate with him or not? He's dwelling in our hearts by faith, Ephesians 3.17. So in our context, in our context, as born-again believers, with Jesus dwelling in our hearts by faith, God has done all these things for us. He continues to do all of these things for us. And he will always do all of these things for those of us that are his children because we've been born again by his spirit and for his glory because it is his nature to do these things. That's why the Apostle Paul could write things like Philippians chapter 3. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14, this is why he could say this. Everything that I've told you tonight, everything that I've told you last week, this is how the Apostle Paul could say what he says right here in Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 12. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. How could he say that? Because he knew that everything that David asked for in Psalm 51 is true and it's real right now. Let's pray. Lord Jesus... We're just humbled. We're just humbled, Lord, by the things that you've done for us and the great gift of repentance that you supply us with. Now, Lord, for myself and for each and every one of us that is hearing this message, even if somebody is listening to this online or watching the video, Lord, that we would once again be restored to that foundational place born again by your spirit indwelt by the crucified resurrected Jesus a new nature that is on track and walking in humble obedience with you Jesus only you can create these things and, and maintain these things within us and we humbly submit ourselves to your sustaining power we have none within ourselves. We, we've got nothing, Jesus. We are bankrupt. So we rely wholly and completely upon you. Now, Lord, show us what it means to walk, not just in obedience, but in cooperation with you and what you're doing in our lives. We look to you, Lord Jesus, and we need your help, and we're asking for it, please. In Jesus' name, amen.